Hey, welcome back to the Hall of Fame College Football Live Show Tuesday night. I'm your host, Jason Watkins, and if you love college football, you're definitely in the right place. So before you forget, smash that red subscriber button, like our videos, and don't forget to ring that bell so you don't miss one moment of the No Hall of Fame College Football Podcast and live streams that we're bringing you every week. Hey, folks. Uh, the ground is shaking, shaking, shaking there in College Station. Jimbo Fisher pretty much may have lost control of this thing in uh, at Texas A&M. Uh, it just gets worse and worse by the day. Saturday, they lose yet another game to a team that really did not uh, – they don't have the built-in advantages of $30 million to pay your recruits coming in. And then um, you find out that after that, you know, they lose to South Carolina. It, it, I mean, good grief. I don't even understand it myself. Uh, this is a team, South Carolina, that just goes in and gets the brakes beat off of it uh, by Arkansas, by Georgia. They pull a win at Kentucky big time for them. But this is a team that's not supposed to be contending with Texas A&M right now. A&M is, you know, picked to be – at least about the third best team in the SEC coming in. Right now, I'm wondering if LSU is sending gift baskets and the like to Texas A&M for paying Jimbo Fisher $100 million and keeping him at the school so that they had to hire uh, Brian Kelly, who is now 5-2, and two, controls his own destiny in the West, SEC West and uh, has an opportunity to play for the SEC title uh, in his first season at the helm there in Baton Rouge. Uh, back to College Station, ugly, 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 ugly. Uh, not only do they lose the game to South Carolina on Saturday, come to find out they lose three offensive linemen for the season after that uh, for an offense that's already trash pretty much i mean i mean you can't really say it any other way that's trash uh he, he doesn't sound good then comes news uh last night that um well three players maybe four i don't know they haven't really I, uh, the official word is three players have been indefinitely suspended by the team for breaking rules uh team rules they are Defensive back Denver Harris, receiver Chris Marshall, and offensive lineman P.J. Williams all suspended. Uh, the rumors out there are that they may have been token on the devil's lettuce inside the locker room of all places. I mean, uh, yeah, you don't have anywhere else on campus to do that, fellas, huh? <laughs> so, I, listen, maybe that's what happened. Maybe it isn't. That's It's all over YouTube now. But uh, let's just sit, look at it this way. Uh, well. Let's uh, I'm going to I'm going to give you a couple of clips of some of the stuff that's going around on YouTube. These are some of my favorite podcasts and uh, guys that are out there. Uh, we're going to throw that up there for you real quick. Fan, and you were hoping that your team could continue building and trending in a positive direction even after the skid we've seen. It's going to be really difficult to do so with the injuries that are piling up, especially the three injuries that were announced yesterday along the offensive line. Because with responding in the manner people are going to want is going to be even more difficult than it already was. So that's an unfortunate situation if you're Jimbo Fisher. Now, the flip side of that is you just got a hundred million dollar contract. You should. Hundred million. That's the other thing too. I mean, what do they do at this point? I mean, I think that everybody at A and M is probably about ready to kick him out the damn door, uh, Jimbo Fisher, of course. But you just you just added a hundred million. What I mean, not that they can't afford to pay it. That's pretty rough, man. It's a, it's a lot of money that could be going to these players. A lot of money that could be going to these players, and this is we know this is how they use the NIL. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, listen. Uh, let me, let me give you another uh, another one. Uh, this one's one of my favorite podcasts for sure. Uh, this is... With the drama here, drama there, drama everywhere. And we're back to tell you everything about it, right? Something like that. Well, the reality is this. Texas A&M has a major culture issue, which is what happens when you buy the best players in the country and don't give a shit about culture, about fit, about character, about mm -hmm. work ethic, desire to be great. The things that actually matter at least equally 
to talent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Jameis isn't coming in the door to save you this time, bud. Uh, I don't really know what to say about this is other than this is not looking good for Jimbo. But again, it's really not looking good for A&M either. So you're looking at it in in terms of, you know, what are you supposed to say? Uh, are they going to pay him the $100 million and just tell, to not coach? Because good grief. But I mean, this, and here's the thing. Why did they give him the freaking contract extent? I mean, I know apparently they wanted to keep him around, and obviously they had a lot of money invested in that number one recruiting class of all time. Uh, you know, according to pretty much rivals two four seven, uh, pretty much all of the major recruiting services have that ranked as the best recruiting class in the history of the game. Then you see, uh, obviously, Saban goes after him. He comes back at Saban. I mean, it's been uh, histrionics. From day one, the uh, 2022, and uh, it just gets keeps getting better. They're ranked number six coming into the season. Um, you know, they've now they're now three and four, having lost to Appalachian State. Uh, they, I mean, got smoked, uh, got smoked by Mississippi State. They've got smoked by now South Carolina, and these are teams that are not set up to win the same way that Texas A and M is. He's never been better that at any point than what uh, you know the pre his predecessor was. You know, you, you got a guy. I mean, shoot, they had long since gotten re got ready to fire the last coach over this same kind of deal. And um, hey, listen, uh, things not looking good there. Right up the road in Austin, little sketchy there as well. Uh, you know, Texas Longhorns go into Stillwater and uh, cough up yet another game that they lead in the second half, uh, this time 17-point lead over Oklahoma State. They cough it up. I, I, ugh, it, and it's just, I don't understand it. I, you sit here and you watch this team. It's full of talent, particularly at the running back position. They're better pretty much at every position. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, some of you Okie State fans, if you're here, you know, this East West thing. And I, from what I understand, there was a lot of win there. And what I saw in the game is I see Spencer Sanders, who had a major, major game. He had, you know, I mean, he's come up small in a lot of situations this weekend. He did not, but it seemed to me like the play calling was just considerably better uh, all the way around. So, um, because he, instead of him throwing a lot of deep balls, he's throwing a lot of underneath routes, 10 yards or less, letting them get a lot of yards after the catch. He's got explosive players there for the Cowboys. Um, but you got the same thing with Texas. Quinn Ewers hits uh, uh, Xavier Worthy on that touchdown pass. It's at the line of scrimmage or behind the line of scrimmage, actually, that he throws the pass. Uh, hit, later hits Bijan for a what a, about a 50-yard touchdown pass uh, out of the backfield as well. Not having to, Those are easy throws. Quinn Ewers goes 19 of 49 because he's trying to thread the needle on deep balls, 20, 25 yards on the sideline, has three picks. I mean, awful game for him. And at some point you would have figured that Sark being this offensive, quote, genius that he is, would have made the game a bit easier for his star quarterback. Uh, no. And, and on top of that, you've got Bijan out there. He's got a long run in the first in the first half. Goes for, and then uh, Roshan Johnson gets a long touchdown run as well. I mean, they weren't really stopping the run in the first half of the game, and uh, but for whatever reason, you know, Sark does what Sark has been prone to do. He is now one and six in road games as head coach at Texas. Uh, he's ten and ten overall. Seven of those ten losses, they. Uh, were games in which the Longhorns blew a second half lead in seven of 10 losses overall. They're 10 and 10. Um, and, and also, Oh, guess what? He's also three and eight in one score games. So he's, he's had 11, one score football games as the head coach at Texas. He's three and eight. Uh, this is a team that, you know, going into last week. And I said this on the podcast last week is that, 
which one of these teams is going to show up small because they generally do. And they both did at certain points of the game, but only when it mattered. And with at the time that a Texas fan is really, really unhappy about in the second half, when you're nursing a, a you know, 17 point lead and you just kind of watch it dwindle away three and out three and out interception, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's just not that good. Now the question would be there is too, You've got this amazing recruiting class that's coming in, headlined by a Manning. Uh, you know, you're talking Arch Manning supposed to be coming in as well next year. Uh, not sure that he would necessarily be playing if you know if you're really high on Quinn Ewers, and up until last week, everybody was. Um, but you know, all this this is starting to look like they're turning it around today. Of course, or, or yesterday, of course. Uh, in his press conference, Sark continues to say that with, things are changing. He's trying to let everybody know things are changing and that they've changed an awful lot uh, for the better. Record aside, he says. Well, listen, we're not talking about, I mean, there's a lot of parody per se, but if you, if you, pretty much any Big 12 fan, if you told them at the start of the year that the top two teams in the conference were going to be TCU and K State, they're you're going to tell them you're crazy, right? And the truth is, is is TCU better than everybody thought? I think they are. Are they college football playoff Big Twelve champion? Good. I'm not positive about that yet. They're going to still have to show me that. Um, I, now, I, not, don't get me wrong. I like what Sonny Dykes has done there. I think that he is obviously a good coach. And uh, and then you got Lincoln's brother. Uh, over there is the offensive coordinator as well. He's proving to be quite the quite the play caller himself. And then they still have the remnants of a defense that was coached up and and put together and built over many years by Gary Patterson, who is now a uh, special assistant, whatever it is, at Texas. Listen, they still got them later in the year, but losing this game on the road at Oklahoma State it, it puts them in a bad position, and really now they have to hope that uh, everybody continues to lose. So they're going to need to hope that, well, first off, you would to, for tiebreaker purposes, you would have to hope that Oklahoma State loses two more games. Not necessarily that they couldn't. They still have to play this week. They're going on the road to Kansas State. Uh, Kansas State was undefeated uh, up until last weekend. They blew an 18-point lead to TCU. Um, but again, this is a this is a time that if you're Texas, you had an opportunity to seize control of this conference and you didn't do it. Uh, same way that the week before Oklahoma State didn't do it with a 17 point lead at TCU. Uh, you know, <laughs> both of them have stumbled uh, and, and you know hurt their chances overall. Now, what I will say is. If you I mean, and I saw this on Twitter earlier today, I know that there's fans that you know they were okay with nine and four or eight, eight and four, nine and three, whatever like that. You that would still be progress if you're Texas, maybe. But at, are they going to get to that point? They still have road games left in this season, and they can't win one. They're one and six on the road, right? And close games seem to just uh, they're his Achilles Achilles heel. You know, I looked at, I saw a stat earlier that he's awful as in one score games at Washington, at USC, and now at Texas. And this is something that I've been saying since day one. Uh, I thought it was the worst hire they could have made. I was so happy they made it as an Oklahoma fan. But I got to tell you, you, you got to figure that as, as a Texas guy, uh, I, I just didn't understand it. The guy's a 500 coach. And he is. He's 500 now, 10 and 10. And um, should be an awful lot better than that. But, you know, as we said, he isn't. So, uh, obviously, the games of the weekend, uh, you know, there was a lot of separation. That, that, or you started seeing, you're starting to see a lot of the cream rise to the top uh, in college football around the country. Um UCLA, who everybody was expecting was going to, you know, maybe go in there and at least give it a game. They really weren't in it for by halftime. It was Oregon was well in control of this game. Chip Kelly's return to Eugene, not a good one for him. 
UCLA gets dumped in that one as well. I mean, there's even people talking that the Ducks might be number four after losing 49 to six or 40, whatever it was in that first game uh, in Atlanta against Georgia. I tend to doubt that a, a bunch, but what has Bo Nix moved himself into the Heisman race? Yeah, he might have. So, uh, fantastic game for the Ducks, and Dan Lanning is is uh, proving to be everything that a lot of these uh, teams thought they thought he was uh, up to and including Oklahoma, who went with Venables. But a, for, there was a lot of a uh, lot of talk around the water cooler that maybe the first choice for Joe Castiglione was indeed Dan Lanning. Um, also, you know, but still just going back to this A&M thing, it's, uh, <laughs> it's so crazy, man. You, you got guys smoking weed in the locker room. Well, that's good. The, it, great culture you got going there, Jimbo. And this is a guy who pounds his chest and talks about how great they are all the time and stuff. And you're three and four. You've lost to App State. You, you, you know, you're losing to South Carolina, who basically everybody was picking to be at the bottom of the, of the league. They're five and two, but yeah, I mean, they're, they've got two decent wins and the teams that are supposed to beat the brakes off of them, beat the brakes off of them, you know? So that's a, this is a bad loss. And especially when you're picked and you're number six in the country coming into the season, uh, you've got pretty much everybody around the country uh, and even in college station saying it's time for him to go. Well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? He's got a hundred million dollars. And, and again, I'm going to say this one more time, LSU send flowers, you should be so, so, so happy with A&M for giving him that money and forcing you to hire Brian Kelly, who, after a monster win on the road, taking down an undefeated Ole Miss squad, uh, is now 5-2 and two, in control of their own destiny if they can just – I mean, obviously, they still got some, some big games that are going to decide. But they are – I mean, they still have a chance to get to that SEC title game uh, this season. In, in his first season at the helm there. And what a difference uh, just a few weeks makes because, you know, you, I think back to that game one against Florida State, and, I mean, Sean Booty, the whole world is talking about this is a terrible hire and it's never going to work. And, I mean, you know, obviously there's – it's starting to – they're starting to buy into what he's doing over there. He's got a good quarterback, an athletic guy that can, that can get some things done. So, uh, you know, we'll – We'll kind of see what happens there. Um, obviously, a little bit of uh, Oklahoma coming off its bye week. Uh, there's some chat here about uh, – I'll, I'll I'll get that into there. We'll get into comments from Brent Venables heading into the second half of the season. They are now 4-3, and three, obviously, going into the bye week. They got a much-needed win after three straight uh, really bad losses. Uh, particularly the TCU Texas showings were just really bad. They bounce back, get a win, um, but they still give up a lot of yardage against Kansas in their last one. Dylan Gabriel gets back into the game after having a concussion that he sustained against TCU. It forced him to miss the Red River game. Um, Venables, you know, kind of talked a little bit about it. He felt like it was a good time to take that break. I think that I, I think that Oklahoma fans pretty much all agree with that. And um, I certainly did. I think it was definitely time for them to get out of there. Talking to my boy Jager earlier in the week, uh, he was saying that, you know, he was relieved that that they didn't. Um, uh, he was definitely relieved about that. So, you know, uh, you know, can they get it turned around? It's a good question. You know, uh, defensively, we have not seen anything like what we saw in those first three games. Of course, it was against lesser talent. But what I didn't I didn't see things that it was a talent thing as much as it was they seem to be getting to the football flying around um plugging holes there you know there it was a little better against Kansas I would say uh two weeks now two weeks ago almost but that being said uh, only a bit only a bit they still gave up 42 points and like 400 yards uh so it's still it's a, it's definitely a work in progress I will say that Obviously, we've talked about it a bunch. A lot of roster turnover for the for the Sooners. But as uh, Coach Venables was saying, there is a lot ahead of them. They uh, he even said uh, as much, talking about that they could win the rest of their games or they could lose them, which I would tend to have to agree with most of that. But uh, take a look at that one real quick. 
is. And, and so that's obviously we're trying to, you know, emulate all that, th- you know, throughout our program. Brent, when you said um, we could win every game, we could certainly lose every game, is that kind of maddening to not be able to know, kind of have that pre Mm-hmm. I don't know preconceived notion of who, no. who you're better than. Or no, not I don't mean to cut you off, but of yeah, I don't mean to cut you off, but that no, that's the game of football. You know, you can't you can't cheat this game. This game will reward you for precision, for your work, for your, uh, your grind. You know what you do in the dark. Uh, it will reward you for that. And it'll punish you for mistakes. So uh, again, whether we're six and zero, oh, I probably would say the same thing as I stand here and look at the schedule sitting in front of us. Uh, you know, uh, so that doesn't surprise me, and it's not maddening. Um, that's this profession. That's this game. And that's why I've always had uh, great, great respect. I think one of the reasons um, that um, I've been uh, on a bunch of successful teams is the leadership, uh, and including myself, buy into the mindset of respecting the game, respecting what it takes to prepare, to play well, to uh, to play consistently, you know, all the, the little things, respecting the mindset of an opponent, uh, you know, playing and competing to a standard every single day. And, uh, you know, like li- you know, deeply buying into that. And if you, if you, you skip a day, if you, again, if, if it's an occasional belief, right, if it's an occasional commitment, then you're going to be exposed. And that's what I'm talking about. It, this game rewards you for what you do consistently, not what you do occasionally. And it doesn't reward you for. for and, you know, obviously, you know, he kind of goes and, it, you know, Brent has a, a ten. Yes. And, and so that's obviously we're trying to, you know, emulate. Sorry. Uh, obviously, you know. Venables sitting there trying to really kind of say that this is all about continuing to buy into this process. He had said at one point in in this press conference that, you know, somebody asked him before the season what would be successful, and it was to be better at the end of the year than you were at the start. Um, They still have that in front of them. I think obviously there was a lot of expectations. Most of them were, uh, or I shouldn't say most of them, a lot of them were very way over the top and, you know, unrealistic by um, when it came to fans, uh, you know, you want to just expect that, you know, they're going to come out and just blow everybody out and be and be a college football playoff team. That's it was unrealistic from the start. That being said, um, there are some positives here. I mean, if you look at this, I mean, another weird thing with some of the fans was attacking the offense rather than the defense for the longest part of this season so far. Dylan Gabriel has proven to be well, first of all, I, w- I would say this again, that he's the most important player to his team probably in the country because we saw what happened when he's not in the game. They're not moving the football. It didn't appear that the guys that they had behind him were ready. And a lot of that, he, something else that Brent Venables brought up was talking about uh, Dylan Gabriel and saying that, you know, look, we, we're really glad to have him back and – you know, you got to remember that there was a ton of turnover in the quarterback room. They lost scholarship players in even Spencer Rattler, who is now at South Carolina. And of course, Caleb Williams, who, you know, they are seven and one there or six and one, whatever it is there at USC. Uh, I mean, they were that cl- I mean, they in the game that they lost on the road at Utah to one of the best defensive coaches or really best coaches in the country, I think. Um he puts up 500 yards or almost 500 yards of total offense and five touchdowns uh, in a loss. So, I mean, when you lose guys like that, uh, you lose receivers. There was a lot of, I mean, there was a lot of talent lost off that, off that offensive team and you still go out and against Kansas, you put out almost 500 yards in the first half, 35 points really could have been 42 because of the fact that they were on the goal line as time expired on halftime. Uh, didn't punch it in from there, but I mean, they had almost 500 and almost, uh, Oh, what the hell was that? Almost 500 yards and almost, uh, you know, well, they had 35 points. This is a big time deal in the game with 701 yards, half a hundred, 52 points. 
and uh, but still only one by 10. So obviously there's plenty of things that need to be done uh, in order for this team to make that next step. What we did find out over the past couple of weeks is that, uh, and this was announced by Brett Yormark of all people, Texas and Oklahoma will remain in conference until 2025. There will be no early buyout. They will stay with the program. Uh, that could, you know, you could look at that a couple of different ways. I would say that giving Coach Venables a little bit longer to get a couple of classes in here. Right now, they still have the fourth ranked recruiting class in the country. Uh, they have, uh, you know, definitely, if not the best quarterback in the country, he's one of them. Uh, you know, in in Jackson Arnold, who. This past weekend uh, just lit up Allen High School uh, almost, what was it, 400 yards or so, almost 400 yards. He had five total touchdowns in the game, you know, almost 100 yards on the ground. Uh, look, amazing game for him. He looks like he's going to be a great addition to this team. They've picked up. They're getting big on the offensive line or defensive line uh, and and in the trenches, period. Um, as of – Right now, none of these, quote, chosen 23 players are decommitting or even talking about decommitting. In fact, uh, you've got some of them that have reiterated their commitment to this program, to these coaching staff. So that's a positive in the right direction. Now, what I would tell you is, is that, you know, the ones that they didn't get, like, uh, oh, man, I don't even want to remember the guy's name because it doesn't matter. He's not coming. Uh, but when you go attacking guys like that in Twitter and doing some of the stuff that some of these fans are doing, you're not helping. You're not helping. So if you really want this team to get better, uh, you you need to allow these guys to do what they're doing and uh, to be able to do just a little bit better. Um, yeah, definitely, Jimmy. Hey, thanks for uh, for chiming into the show. It was absolutely yeah. It was the best. It was the best offensive showing for them. But if you look at the K State game, I mean, they had 550 yards in that one. And so, uh, you know, they lost the game, but this has not really been an offensive issue aside from the weeks that Dylan wasn't in. So, uh, yeah, but absolutely. When you put up 701 yards and uh, and and 52 points, um, you should win. You know, you definitely should win. And uh, But this defensive issue that's been going on in Norman has been going on for a while. So it's not something that we can sit here and say, you know, it, it came with Venables. It was already here, and they turned over 13 players that were on the depth chart a year ago for the defense, not there anymore. You know, whether they transferred out, some of them went with Lincoln, some of them, you know, some of them went to the league. Uh, but it is kind of what it is. Um, now they look to going up against a team in uh, Iowa State this weekend who's struggled. You know, they've struggled. and They've been in a lot of close games. Uh, they lost – close one to Baylor. They lost a very close one that, I mean, really Texas could have lost another one score game there. Um, and because they, you know, they got a fumble right at the end of the game, but what looked like targeting and then what looked like not a fumble. So they got two benefit of the doubt calls in that one. Uh, they end up winning it, but, uh, Iowa state's just kind of been on the wrong side of the luck, uh, all most of the season. They lost a, a close one at Kansas, uh, you know, pretty much it's just been it's just been a struggle for them. Now, they still do have the number one scoring defense, uh, number one defense in the conference. And uh, that's something that Venables, you know, he talked at, at length about it. it. It appears that he uh, really is impressed with Matt Campbell and his program. And nobody else right now. Mm -hmm. Both and you, you build defenses over time. If you can take like a 30,000 foot view on mm -hmm. Iowa State. What maybe impresses you or fascinates you most about the success, the identity that they built on defense there? Well, I think um, the courage that it takes to make a, a drastic change like that. I think they did that, you know, middle of the season years ago. Uh, and, and again, they, they do throughout the last X number of years, you know, one of the things that you really respect about Coach Campbell is, uh, and their staff is the development of their players. And, uh, you know, I've always, uh, coaches, you know, you try to take pride in, in getting guys to play beyond their ability. And they've. they've Oops. Well, I thought I was there. Whoops. Let's 
Sorry for the technical difficulties here. Yes. And, and so that's obviously we're trying to, you know, emulate all that, th you know, throughout our program. Brent, when you said um, we could win every game, we could certainly lose every game. Is that kind of maddening? I'm, nobody else right now. Mm -hmm. you, you build defenses over time. If you can take like a 30,000 foot view on mm -hmm. Iowa State, what maybe impresses you or fascinates you most about the success, the identity that they built on defense there? Well, I think um, the courage that it takes to make a, a drastic change like that, I think they did. They did. I wanted to show that second part again, or that part again, uh, just to talk about that is like the courage to make a change. Uh, in in terms of what he's talking about, he kind of changed around his defense right away mid season uh, to something that more was suitable for that Iowa State program at the time. Um, it's something that you might think about. I mean, I think a lot of people have talked about what the the players that are there were not recruited for the most part by this coaching staff. And they were recruited to play a different kind of defense, that speed defense that Alex Grinch likes to play, um, which I still don't understand that. I mean, you, when you're at a program like Oklahoma or USC, you can get those big guys. So, um, But that being said, you, you have what you have. I hate this idea that a lot of it, and it goes around, you see it a lot, that he doesn't have his guys yet. And it's like you're throwing away the ones that you got. These are players that were re recruited to Oklahoma. You don't get recruited to Oklahoma ever if you are not a, a top-level player in the country in high school, period. It doesn't matter if it's offense, defense, whatever. Whatever has gone on over the last 10, 15, whatever years that really this defense has suffered, um, I, I just got to tell you, I feel like – Maybe it is you got to change things up a little bit. And he was talking about the courage that Matt Campbell had to be able to do that during his tenure at Iowa State. I would tell you that maybe you need to do the same thing. I know a lot of people are calling for Ted Aru's head. Um, maybe he's maybe he's not the guy. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not I'm not ready to say that yet. I I know if if Coach V trusts in him, then I don't know. Maybe you should. That being said, they're not doing well. And if that's the case, at what point do you just start calling the defense yourself? This is what you're good at, you know? And if you got a guy like Lincoln or any of these other offensive coaches now, right now Jimbo needs to stop calling the offense for uh, Texas A&M, I would say. But if these offensive coaches are sitting there calling the plays for the offense, why is a defensive-minded head coach like BV so reluctant to do it? Uh, you know, or give it to Todd Bates instead of Roof or whatever. Do something, but you got to make a change and have the courage to do that if you're going to put these guys in a position to win some of these games. You know, chances are you're not going to score the same amount. I mean, you would hope that they put up some points, but you're probably going to have to because they've got a dual threat quarterback at Iowa State as well. Uh, this kid has he's come out good. They, I mean, they're still good. they're offensively sound. You know, are they going to put up 50? Probably not. But they could against this defense the way it's played. So it's hard to, you know, to really to put that on your D, on your offense every week to have to score 50. is you got to find something in that defense that works, at least somehow. Um, I would say that the, a couple of the, the bright spots that you see in their last game against Kansas, they get two turnovers uh, as – and um, – they're able to do some stuff, you know, that it helped them win. But you would also say that it was a backup quarterback that they put up 42 points on this defense still. You know, it, it just doesn't look that great. It just doesn't look that great. But it, in any event, um, you know, it's it, we're going to find out a lot about this team, and that's basically what I got from this press conference overall. It was a long press conference too. But, you know, talking just a lot about the fact that they can still salvage a season and, you know, to stay focused. If they can stay focused and do the things they're doing, then this coaching staff is doing its job uh, to keep them together. This is a time that it would be easy to lose it. Now, having one coming into the bye week, um, you would hope that that's kind of pointing in a better direction. But then again, you know, Kansas turned around and got beat up again 
uh, last week. So it looks like they're finally kind of falling back to what you kind of expected the Jayhawks to be coming into the season. They don't have Jalen Daniels anymore, and that's definitely hurting him. Uh, he may be back at some point, um, but, I mean, it may just be just in time to really uh, kind of maybe hurt Texas. <laughs> But uh, talking a little bit about, listen, uh, there's a couple of other things. Uh, there's a lot of stuff talking about Texas, though. Uh, one of the big things that people are really upset about, and he had to apologize for, Sark said they did not stand around and sing the Texas song at I don't know, Eyes of Texas are upon you, I guess, uh, after the game. He said that he was angry and just left the field, and then his, his uh, players did the same thing. So... He had some explaining to do on that. I think that's pretty funny. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, look, man, these little things are the kind of little things that you start looking at, and it's like, man, does he have total control of this program? Not really, you know? And, and clearly he has a an issue with uh, making adjustments, you know, in-game adjustments. You know, you saw it last year in the, in the Red River game where, you know, they go up 28 28- you know, 28-7, and then, you know, and at really at any point, I mean, even though Caleb Williams was doing what he was doing, you could have continued to either, you know, you, you still have Bijan Robinson. You could, There was things that they should have done. They did not make an adjustment. They didn't look good in the second half at all, and next thing you know, they get beat in regulation. Didn't even take it to overtime. So, uh, you know, obviously I, that's a fun game for me to remember. But it's the same thing this past weekend in Stillwater. You know, it really was. And it's just uh, when you look at it, I don't know. I don't know how you lose that game. And I know with Bryce, we're sitting there talking during the game, and he's got he's got Bijan in one of his fantasy deals on, on FanDuel or uh, DraftKings, whatever it was, and he's screaming, give him the football, give him the football. And he wasn't. You know, in the times that he did, it would turn into a decent a decent play. But then they're trying to thread the needle, and it just – I didn't understand the play calling at all. I thought it was bad. And this is supposed to be one of the best, uh, you know, one of the best offensive play callers in the world. That's why they hired him because of what he did at Oklahoma or not at Alabama with Nick Saban. And obviously on the, uh, everything that, you know, that that was that led to for, you know, obviously you had a Heisman Trophy winner. Matt uh, Matt Jones becomes a first-round pick for uh, the Patriots. I mean, look, that was a heck of a team. But this is not what we see now that he's at Texas, and it's not what you saw when he was at USC. It's not what you saw when he was at Washington. They're a 500 team, and this is what's going on. But, um, yeah, so anyway, guys, uh. I would say that um, I, you tend to wonder how much, how strong a hold both he and Jimbo have on these jobs. I think that Jimbo, the one saving grace for him, as they said, $100 million contract that they just gave him. This one would be that that recruiting classes, the, the recruiting class that Texas has coming in, some of the, you know, a Manning coming with it. Uh, you would, maybe you give him another year. If if things continue the way they are, though, I I mean I mean look, we watched how Texas does things. They are a knee jerk reaction type of type of program. You could see them, and you can already kind of see it. There's a lot of people that are getting pretty fed up with watching these second half performances and them cough up leads the way that they did this weekend. So I wouldn't be surprised if it, they. I I get the feeling myself. He better win some freaking games coming down the stretch, and then one of them better be a road game, and they better not cough up a whole lot more. They they can't afford to be coughing up leads like they have been. And literally, they I mean, seven out of ten losses as head coach at Texas, they've had a lead in the second half. Yeah, uh, wow, you know this is amazing. Uh, around the country couple of different headlines you know going on obviously this week coming up uh the top team in the big 12 tcu will travel to west virginia to take on the mountaineers you would probably expect them to win although baylor went on the road and got beat over there um you have oklahoma state coming off of this big win they have to go on the road and back it up now 
uh, at Kansas State. It looks like Adrian Martinez should be back in, or at least that's what Mike Gundy thinks. Um, and, you know, they were uh, – obviously he was kind of stroking his own ego a little bit during the press conference yesterday, uh, talking about their – you know, there was a lot of – you know, for all the – Culture talk around A and M. Everybody's given all kinds of credit for culture at to, at Oklahoma State. My, you know, my the troll in me says it's a culture of what regular season, good or half kind of good. You know, when are you going to win a conference championship? Play for a, get a shot at the CFP. Uh, you know, I still tend to believe that they won't this year. I don't believe that Spencer Sanders in the biggest of moments is is the guy that's going to really step up and get that done. We'll see. There's there's still some uh, big games coming for them. If you look uh, kind of at, let's see. So this week, they uh, again, they will be on the road at Kansas State. Uh, that's going to be a big game. And the problem is that Kansas State knows who they are. They're going to run the football. And particularly when Adrian Martinez is in the game, they're going to – I mean, that's – the way that they turned that thing around after the two lane loss and what they did at Oklahoma is really what they did all the way up until last week when he got hurt. Um, they still had an 18 point lead and coughed it up, but really it was just a matter of, they didn't move the ball at all after, uh, after they got up to 28, 10. Um, you've got uh, also, let's see, I'm going to go back to this conference schedule. Um, Baylor goes on the road to take on Texas Tech. Uh, Oklahoma, as we said, will be in Ames to take on the Cyclones at Iowa State. Um, then next week, we're talking about you know Oklahoma State, they go on the road to play Kansas. Uh, it, it, Kansas is a different team if Jalen Daniels is around. So far, it doesn't look like he's coming back yet, um, but you never know. Uh, so if they, I mean, you would expect them to win that one. Then the week after that is Bedlam. Um, so this is a time if they can get this win this week, if you're Oklahoma state, you go up and get a win in Manhattan. Um, you secure that second place spot and that, that second position in the big 12 championship game, but then you're going to have to turn around and hold on to it on the road in Norman against your biggest rival who even there's been, Hey, th there's a lot of history that shows Oklahoma State not getting these games when they need them. Uh, and this is, there will never be a bigger time that they need it than right then on uh, November 19th in Norman. Um, even if they win that one, they'll have one more. No, no, they won't. Oops. Well, maybe they do. Yeah, so no, so that that's uh no, they do. They've got one more after that. They will have uh hosting West Virginia. You would think that they would take care of that one if they can win the game against Oklahoma. But again, myself and you know, the, you can say what you want, but I've watched these guys in Oklahoma's worst years in the past where they cough that sucker up and don't win the game. So um and how many times I mean help me out with this one. You know, fans, how many times have they won two in a row over the Sooners? They've only got, what, 19 all-time victories over Oklahoma? So, um, look, there's a chance to do it, but this is usually when you see this, and that's what I'm talking about, this culture, is that their culture is, you know, yeah, he's been there 18 years. I would hope his culture is in place. I don't know that it's the greatest one out there. I just don't. So, you know, they, they get a lot of regular season wins and they seem to love it and all that stuff. But, I mean, good grief. At some point, maybe you want to win conference championship or two, you know. And um, and especially the fact, and like a lot of it too, you know, I part of it that bothers me is that now they're making excuses to not play the Bedlam game once Oklahoma goes to the SEC. And it's it's just that excuses. Good grief. Uh, it's logistical problems get out of here come on man um anyway uh now tcu of course talking about them they uh, this week they are going to be at west virginia you i would pencil in a win there you know i would or you would think that you could pencil in a win there um 
obviously Baylor having lost on the road there. I mean, you, you don't want to jump the gun too much, but, uh, let's see, where are we on here? Yeah. So then the week after that, let's see we are in all oh, good grief, Jason, stupid schedule. Okay. So yeah, this week, uh, TCU, Still in the wrong day and week. Yeah, TCU at West Virginia, followed by they will go the next week. They will play host to Texas Tech, and they got a lot of home games, man. It just seems like all TCU's games are home games. They play host to Texas Tech in week 10 on November the 5th. Then you turn around and you got on the road at Texas. Now, again, that would be – I mean, Texas hasn't had as much heart of a hard time winning at home, but they haven't won all, all at home either. So, you know, they lost last year uh, a few of those games at home as well. They, I mean, everything came after that Oklahoma loss in the Red River that it just kind of came apart. They had leads at the half of almost every game after that. In fact, they lost all but one coming down the stretch, and it was uh, in having leads in the at halftime of every game. So, uh, you know, look, <clears throat> Texas needs to get it together, I would think. And, and Sark is going to have to find a way to make an adjustment after the half or else I would, again, I wouldn't, I would almost expect that they're going to fire him, even with a recruiting class. So uh, I, I just don't know. And maybe they don't. Maybe they don't. I, would, I wouldn't tell them to because I would say, hey, you've, the recruiting classes that you got, you might want to give him one more year. But. I mean, this isn't a. This is not a, a, a university that wastes a whole lot of time on stuff like that. You know, I felt like that, that it was a bad move to get rid of, and I know everybody seems to think that he was a dumpster fire, but I thought Tom Herman was on his way. You know, and I mean, he'd beaten Oklahoma before. He had, you know, they played for a, a conference title. They hadn't really played for one in a long time, so I I thought it was kind of crazy, but in this case. I mean, these are glaring problems. You're one and six on the road in 20 games. Uh, you are now three and eight in one score games as uh, with him at, at the helm. And then you've what it's, uh, I mean, they've given up essentially what half time or what 10, 10 point lead, seven out of 10 losses. They're 10 and 10 overall under Sark. Seven of those 10 losses. They had a they had a lead in the second half, and uh, last week it was seventeen points. So, you know, it's a little crazy there. Uh, also going on around the country, um, I, I guess there was a bit there was some kind of a fight or whatever uh, two weeks ago uh, when Penn State was at Michigan. Harbaugh turned the blame onto Franklin uh, to Coach Franklin from Penn, from Penn State uh, this past week. Um, also, Cade Klubnik came in in relief of DJ Uyunglele, whereas Clemson was down 21 to 7 uh, to Syracuse at home. DJ had what? It was three turnovers right in succession right away. And so it was starting to look ugly for them. They go to Klubnik, the first year player uh, out of uh, South Texas somewhere, a really good player. He was one of the top recruits in the country. Um, now Dabo Sweeney is still saying that DJ is his starter. You tend to wonder, obviously the leash is going to get shorter and shorter. And uh, last year when this started happening, he started hearing footsteps behind him and they did, they kind of fell apart. I wouldn't think that Dabo has a whole lot of a long leash. I know he's trying to keep him, uh, it, that he has confidence in him. I don't think he has any confidence in him. And you really, I mean, the good news for for Clemson is that they've gotten through the meatiest part of their schedule. They've beaten the better teams in the conference, uh, you know, Wake Forest, NC State, Florida State even, um, even though Florida State stumbled a bit at that time. But they, you know, coming into that, they were they only had a couple of losses. But um, then also, uh, yeah, so – I, I mean, I, th- I think st- stay tuned to this stuff down in uh, in Texas because I feel like at Austin and just down the road in College Station, 
uh, we're, we can find a lot of things happening anytime. We'll jump back on here. If I hear anything, uh, and we, we come up with anything new, uh, here in the next few hours, I'll jump back in here and let you know, uh, whenever we hear about it. But as of now, you know, you know, Fisher hasn't said that he's giving up play calling duty. Uh, they haven't fired him yet or anything like that, but there's definitely rumblings around, uh, around college station from the media in college station, definitely from the fans. They're getting sick of it. And, uh, why wouldn't you, I mean, you know, you get literally, this is the second time this season that you've had to, uh, suspend players from this vaunted 2022 number one, all time recruiting class. And, uh, apparently this time again, you know, uh, the devil's lettuce (laughs) and, uh, Hey, you know what, Jimmy, that is a great, I did. Can they flip Hicks? I think anything's up for grabs at this point because it's obvious. I mean, I I mean, listen, it doesn't take, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to know how they're getting these guys in there. It's certainly not for coaching or for, you know, them having a belief in their, in what they're doing and and the, the, the direction that they're taking this program in. They've not been better than eight and four. They won't go eight and four this year unless they win out, which doesn't seem likely. You know, literally Kevin Sumlin had a better record at this point of his career that they fired him than what than what he's got here. Uh, they've had one decent season. It was the COVID year. I mean, you can say what you want about that. I don't know. But can they flip Hicks? That was the five-star defensive, defensive uh, lineman that everybody wanted. Um, they obviously coughed up a big amount of cash there. Could you see him maybe flipping over to Oklahoma? Possibly. Um, I would think it would probably take Jimbo leaving, and uh, maybe they they take the money back or something. But I don't know why they would. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's it's a thought. Uh, I mean, I'd like to see that I, as an Oklahoma fan. Of course, that's what you would hope for. All I, only thing I do know is that that Hicks himself said that he got a lot of uh, pretty crazy tweets at him after choosing. A and M from Oklahoma fans. Uh, again, not a good look. Not a good look, guys. So uh, I don't know. I think it would be. Uh, it would definitely help out the cause on the defensive side of the ball in um, Norman. But a lot of these guys that they've already picked up. I mean, and it's a it's a good list of of, of players uh, going to it. We'll take a look at um, just kind of who these guys. Some of these guys are. I mean, you're lo- you're talking about. Let's see. Give me one second. Come on. So, yeah, and so um, Oklahoma, and the, the thing is that they still haven't lost anybody. So that's a that's another one of the positives that I've been taking out of this is that despite the three game losing streak and and the way it's looked. A lot of these guys, like, you know, you had um, uh, Samuel uh, Omozigo uh, from Crandall, Texas, who's the big linebacker that he's kind of been recruiting the, all of them. Colton Vasek, uh, who's, you know, he's a Texas legacy guy, but he still seems committed. He said that he still has belief in, um, and, and Vasek is that edge rusher that, you know, four-star could turn into a five-star by the end of it. I've seen a lot of him and his highlights uh, this season, and this guy is unreal. Um, they hadn't lost him. They've got Jacob Johnson, uh, you know, who's another four-star. Makari Vickers had said really early on that he was still um, – or no, it was Petaway that immediately was saying that he was still on board. Um, you know, uh, out of Bawari, uh, you know, your, your five-star – edge rusher as well that from North Kansas city, he still appears to be nobody. Everybody is still committed. So they're still at number four. You've got, um, you know, but these you're talking about the defensive line. You've got Derek LeBlanc. He comes from Florida. You know, they're recruiting well in Florida. Um, he hasn't wavered at either. Um, again, I was talking about Vasek and then you've got, uh, Lewis Carter, Josiah Wagner. I mean, these are all four-star guys that are, defensive players that are should make an impact pretty quick. So, um, you know, it's, 
I mean, listen, this is a nice recruiting class, man. It just really is. So, um, hoping that they can keep it together. Obviously, they got a big they got a big task ahead of them. Winning at Iowa State isn't the easiest thing, and I don't care, you know what what's happened throughout the season. This is Matt Campbell knows what he's doing with this program. Um, he's proven that. I mean, what what was Iowa State before he got there? So they've kind of fallen on some hard times and had some close losses and some things that didn't go their way. The Baylor game, they had some calls that that Matt was livid over. Uh, he was definitely upset uh, in in the other one as well. So, um, but uh, yeah. Oh, Bobby. Hey, Bobby. There he is. Uh, word on the street. Hicks still talking to OU. I've heard that as well. Um, you know what? I mean, and yes, I could see them. I could see a mass exodus coming. They've already got, you know, he suspended these three guys indefinitely for whatever, whatever it was. And, and I mean, the rumors out there, but there's a lot of people that are apparently very unhappy, uh, with the way things are going. You've, you've heard things about, you know, uh, when people have a tweet about, about Jimbo and needing to change up that offense or do this or, do, or that it's pedestrian or whatever. And you got players liking the tweet and doing stuff like that. I mean, it, it what's going on at Texas A&M is not a good thing. It's not a good look and it doesn't look good for them. So yeah, could Hicks still be in the mix and is he still talking to OU? Probably, you know, everybody in, out there in the Twitter world, leave the dude alone, Shh. leave him alone. <laughs> Just let him do his thing. And that's weird. Anyway, to, to, tweeting at, kids you know that are recruits because you're you know it's just isn't that weird i don't understand that but uh maybe uh you can see it happening you can see it happening i mean you know but they 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 could lose this whole thing even if he stays they could lose this whole thing but if they lose it uh i don't really see why you keep jimbo around and you know um at that point other than the fact that you already owe him 100 million bucks and again lsu Send them flowers, send them a gift basket. You got to do something. I mean, they gave him this money so that you didn't hire him and you ended up with with a with a good hire. Got a chance to win the SEC West still at five and two, even after the start that you had uh to the season. Uh that five and two record, they still have a shot. So we'll see how all that goes. Hey guys, I'm gonna go ahead and jump off of here on this one. Hey, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. We have been steadily rising on our subscribers. Our watch hours are up, 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 and we appreciate that. But, and if you'd like to help the show, we have a couple of ways to do it. We will have some, some newer ways to do it as well. We're going to go live on Thursday as well to preview um, the upcoming weekend. Uh, again, we'll talk a little bit more about, I, I, my guess is we'll have some new news by then for sure. Then we will have the live recap show saturday night every saturday night at 11 eastern time as well but if you'd like to uh you know help out the show and add to your to your uh merchandise team merchandise team merchandise wardrobe at the same time click onto our website first hofmedia.us slash fanatics that's hofmedia.us slash fanatics just uh you tap on the Logo that says Fanatics, bottom of the page, shop as normal. Just for doing that, you're going to get up to 65% off everything in the entire store. These are exclusive discounts just for people that go through our link. Also, um, if you do decide while you're on that page to sign up for our mailing list, we have some new partnerships that we're getting ready to announce here in the next couple of weeks. We will send you deals and or and even our episodes right to your inbox every time we go live or we put out a new episode on YouTube or on just the podcast, the audio site. Uh, you'll have it every time. So make sure that you do that as well. You don't have to. You can still get the deals that you need just by clicking that button at the bottom. But if you do sign up, there are some additional uh, perks for doing so. And, and guys, some of these uh, you're going to see, we're going to, as we announce it, you're going to see that some of these other partnerships are really cool, uh, great discounts, you know, and and chances to, you know, save some money on some of the stuff that you already use anyway. Um, again, we really want to get to that thousand subscriber mark. If you haven't already subscribed, please, please, please smash that red subscriber button uh, here on YouTube. Um, continue to subscribe to us as well there on uh 
on Facebook as well. We'd appreciate that too, but we really need it on YouTube. We need subscribers. We are almost to 500 at this point. We need to get to a thousand. It goes a little quicker every hundred you get, uh, but we've done pretty well and I'm, and I'm staying patient about it. Our watch, as I said, our watch time is fabulous and I appreciate everybody, but share us. If you enjoy the channel and enjoy what you're getting, share us with some of your friends. You know, I mean, anybody college football fans, uh, they got other friends that are college football fans. Share the podcast. Let us know. Uh, if there's something you want to see on our show, uh, let us know in the comments. You know, let us know at sound off at hofmedia.us. That's our email. Sound off at hofmedia.us. We don't mind going back and forth with you kind of, uh, you know, in the regular comments as well. I'm going to repost these comments also. But um, li listen, get in the comments. Let us know what you think. If you disagree with us, that's fine. Just keep it. Don't get too personal and say some of the things like a couple of people said in the video last week. You, do, you guys do realize that Bryce is, kind of antagonizes things for a reason. Um, getting personal about it like that, I mean, come on, man. I don't care what hat he's wearing or if he is a Texas fan. Settle down. You know, we don't need that. And we don't, we don't need those kind of people watching the show. So we want – we. We're all up for debate. We we enjoy that. That's fun, and we and yeah, we bust chops a little bit ourselves. I mean, I do it with Texas. I do it with Oklahoma State. You know, that's just part of the fun. But you know, and keep it fun. But don't get just do us a favor. Don't get personal like what a, a couple of the comments I saw this past week. Uh, but again, hey, thanks a lot, guys. We appreciate you uh, uh, showing up again for this episode of the Hall of Fame College Football Live Show. Uh, and the Hall of Fame College Football Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Watkins. We will see you on the next one. Thanks.